Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Getting Personal with Parkinson's Facebook Conversation Series. I'm Caroline Colas, the Senior Director of Health and Wellness for the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan and the Program Coordinator for the Edmund J. Safra Wellness Program, supported by New York Health's largest healthcare provider. Provider, Northwell Health. For over 14 years, the JCC has been hosting programs for individuals living with PD. You can find these programs on our website at www.mmjccm.org forward slash Parkinson's. See the link in our comment section and the chat below. This program is for those, anyone, those whose life has been impacted by, BT, by PD including family and friends. And we wanted to put a face to Parkinson's and to introduce you to people living and thriving with PD. None of those folks are quite like David Leventhal. I cannot wait to introduce you to him. I'm just so excited. He is the founding teacher and program, one of the founding teacher and program director for the Dance for PD, a program of the Mark Morris Dance Group, which recently celebrated its 20th anniversary just last month. Dance for PD has been used as a model for classes in more than 300 communities and in 25 countries. David not only leads classes for people living with Parkinson's disease around the world and trains other teaching artists, artists and dance for PD approach, he has also co-produced five volumes of a successful instructional video series and helped conceive and design Moving Through Glass, a dance-based Google Glass app for people living with Parkinson's. He received the 2018 Martha Hill Mid-Career Award, the 2016 World Parkinson's Congress Award for Distinguished Contribution to the Parkinson's Community, and was a co-recipient of the 2003 Alan Boander Human Humanitarian Award from the Parkinson's Unity Walk. As a dancer, he performed with Mark Morris Dance Group from 1997 to 2011, appearing in principal roles in some of Mark Morris's most celebrated and beloved works, receiving a 2010 Bessie Award for his performance career. And I can say I've had the privilege of sharing the teaching stage with him at the Parkinson's Walk held annually in Central Park, and he is extraordinary. I'm thrilled to share a conversation that David and I had recently. You'll see how passionate and how humble David is about his own contribution to the work. If you have questions or comments or you'd like to listen to our conversation, um, please put them in the chat while this plays and I'll happily answer them after the conversation. Thanks so much for joining me today. And now here's the recording. Well, first of all, David Leventhal of Dance for PD, thank you so much for joining me. This is a conversation that I have been wanting to have for a long time. Um, of course, I've admired you and also had the opportunity to dance with you on uh, the stage at the uh, walk for PD. You've helped us out and, and we've participated in your classes and it's just been so much fun over the years, just watching your program grow and sharing students and Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm really delighted and, and honored to be here, Caroline. Thank you for having me as a guest. So I'm curious about a lot of things, but I wanted to make a, a note that 20 years ago, the Dance for PD program started, and I know Oli had this idea, and then did Mark, Mark of the Mark Morris Dance Company, everyone, did he get involved at all in the this process? Well, Mark was involved in that Mark had the vision for opening a dance center in Brooklyn mm -hmm. that was to be a community center rather than a conservatory school. You know, when you're trying to decide what kind of dance program you want to offer, you are thinking about, you know, who's, who's coming in the doors. And I think for Mark, the people coming in the doors represented the full breadth of the community rather than just those people who were professional dancers. So it was his vision that set up the opportunity for Oli Westheimer to come through those doors and pitch this idea of a dance class for people in the support group that she, that she led called the Brooklyn Parkinson Group. And I think without Mark's vision, there would be no building and there would be no dance for PD. 
So yes, you could say that he's very responsible for it. But the idea for the program really came from Oli and came from her listening to members of her support group talk about some of the strategies they used to try to move and try to initiate movement. And also the sense that they felt surrounded by Parkinson's. They felt completely enmeshed and trapped by Parkinson's and that it infiltrated so many aspects of their lives. They really wanted opportunities to be humans without Parkinson's, or at least to, to step away from Parkinson's for some time and to, to do other things, talk about other things, be in a different context. And I think Oli's genius was putting those two elements together, the idea of listening to movement strategies and thinking about how dancers use movement strategies in everything that we do. And also the idea of creating activity that had nothing to do with Parkinson's, at least at the outset. And that was, that was really her, her pitch was a, a real dance class taught by dancers who were there to share their knowledge and their experience as people who think about movement and movement strategies all the time and who can create a space where the focus is on art and art making rather than on Parkinson's. Right. I think that was kind of radical at the time, Caroline. Absolutely. You know, remember, to- yeah, remember, I mean, 20 years ago, and we started our program about 15 years ago, people weren't being told to even exercise. So yeah. this, this was very, very radical. And, and it's so funny, we share that in that Alessandra DeRocco, Dr. DeRocco, walked over to the JCC, right, and approached our CEO who had a similar vision in terms of creating community. We had a special needs program and he had apparently, I just learned this recently, like, you know, last, last month or a couple months ago that when we were telling this, the history behind um, the program and he said that he had approached other organizations and they had said no, hmm. but her vision similar to Mark's was, you know, this is a community center. And when he approached her about, hey, I want to have a place where people living with Parkinson's can go and be a part of the community, she said, we have to, we have to make this happen. And then she turned to me and said, <laughs> make it happen. And it sounds like in some ways, Mark or Oli might have turned to you. Or when did you become involved in the, in the process? So Oli had a meeting with our executive director, Nancy Umanoff, and presented this idea. And Nancy was very enthusiastic about it. But, you know, no one involved in the early stages of this project that became a program had a personal connection with Parkinson's. We did have a personal desire to be, again, a community center and to, to create dance programming that was open to anybody. So Nancy said, yes, let's do it. it I will provide teaching artists, musicians, and space if you, Oli, can provide the participants. That's not something that we, we didn't have that connection yet. So, uh, and then the first class was supposed to be my colleague, also from Mark Morris Dance Group, named John Higginbotham. But John had a family emergency a few days before that very first class in October of 2001. And, and I, was, I was asked, I was the, the second choice. And um, I said, David, can you fill in for John while John's away? Um, helping his dad. And, and I said, sure, but I, I don't know anything about Parkinson's. Uh, and so that's really how I got involved. And then when John came back, I'd had such a transformative experience in that first class as a teacher, as a dancer, as a member of this community that I, I begged him to let me co-teach with him. <laughs> and so we co-taught that program for 10 years until yeah. we both retired from dancing for the company. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it became, we added a third teacher as well soon after named Misty Owens. And the three of us really uh, worked together with Oli to create what became the Dance for PD approach and methodology and curriculum. And I had a similar experience. I was gonna, I was always curious about that. When I started teaching, I fell in love 
with the students I fell in love with, um, their courage, their bravery, their tenacity, and just all walks of life and how it made such a difference to move, right? And um, for me, you know, teaching Mia as, uh, which is a form of dance movement exercise, cross training through movement, um, it just seemed like it was a good fit, like it was making a difference. And I, I hear you saying the same thing. In many ways with performing, you're, you're giving, giving, giving. And, you know, there is a pause, you hope at the end, but you don't really get a chance to understand the impact of what you do as a performer. You know that people are inspired. You know that they come away having had a, you hope, a wonderful evening in the theater, but you're not necessarily able to see the effects of what you're doing. Whereas in the in the Dance for PD class, any teaching, but particularly the Dance for PD experience, as you said, Caroline, the impact is instantaneous. I mean, mm -hmm. I loved, even from that very first class, seeing people moving differently, thinking differently, listening differently from being dancers and coming into that studio. Uh, and that, that happens even in a single class. Of course, we also saw changes over time, but within that single class from the from two o'clock to three o'clock, you would see movement changes that I found astounding. And when when neurologists came in, they also found it astounding because they knew many of these participants really well and they were aware of movement patterns that they saw. And then suddenly in the class, those patterns were transformed, expanded, developed, and it was uh, it was eye opening for them too. So, for me as a performer, I loved performing. I loved sharing works that we were performing with the dance for PD class. So they really got a sense of uh, of learning choreographic repertory and understanding that work from the inside out, and then going to see the work and really feeling that they are part of an artistic community. And that's so important, I think, when you start to feel that certain communities are are maybe cut off for you or that you're you're losing a sense of connection with certain communities that you had. And so to be able to forge new connections with this artistic community, I think, is really important. And the connection between performing and teaching is is a way of bridging those two. But but really the the teaching was in some ways an antidote to the, you know, the performing in terms of it's not about me anymore. It's really about putting all of my efforts into ensuring the best possible experience for the Parkinson's dancers in the class. And I loved that shift of focus so much and, and still do. Been, That's why I still yeah. do this. Yeah. <laughs> it became more important to me than, you know, yeah. than yeah. preparing to perform. And for me, one of the things that it shares that performing gave me was there was a there was a reason why to study and to to design things. And and it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the students got that as well, that circularity of, wait a minute, I'm going to do this movement and learn this phrase and I'm going to see it on the company and then I might even be part of the company. And and then there's an, a circular experience that doesn't happen in my experience with just exercise. So I love that aspect of it. And I, I really appreciate what you were saying about, you know, the breaking the fourth wall, like the audience to the audience, when their students are in the room, you're, you're getting to sense them, you're getting to see them transformation in the moment, and watching somebody be able to move and blossom uh, is, is just such an elixir. You have brought neurologists in from the beginning, and some people know about your interest in research and work with Google Glass and all that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's been something that it must have evoked your curiosity really early on. Let us know a little bit more about that process and what you've discovered. Hmm. Well, I've always been fascinated by the processes that people use to uh, to, to move and to think about movement. And, you know, at the beginning, I think we were quite adamant about this not being a clinical class. This, this is not a place where you're tested, where you are, um, 
where every single thing that we do is supported by data. This is a, this is based on an art form that is thousands of years old, you know, but I knew right away that it was important for the medical community to understand what we were doing in, in class and with our participants in a way that they might feel comfortable speaking with other people about it, whether those people were colleagues or researchers or, other other patients and i don't i don't really like using that term but in this case i'm trying to be very specific um because we knew it was going to take a while for the research to start to be done and published about the impact of dance and parkinson's the waiting period waiting for that research to come out we knew that we we needed to go for anecdotal evidence and we certainly had participants talking about their experience, but we also wanted to have neurologists who are familiar with what happened in that studio talk about it with um, sort of a first-person knowledge. Uh, and then, of course, that was buttressed by research that started coming out around 2008, 2009 that supported everything that the neurologists witnessed when they came into class, but was supported by, um, by quantitative and qualitative data that that was starting to come out so you know what it was also i think it goes back to that idea of community we always thought of medical professionals and neurologists as part of the community we are all working as a team to support people with parkinson's and we we invited them to class because they were they were vital members of the team of course and we wanted them to think of us us poor lowly dance teachers also as members of the team, you know, that we were, we were there supporting, yeah. <laughs> supporting their, their efforts to improve quality of life for people living with Parkinson's. And that along with the neurologist, the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the social workers, the nurses, the exercise instructors, um, we were all part of the same team. And, and I think the invitation was a way of forging that sense yeah, I'm, I'm sort of giggling because remember, I, everyone, 20 years ago, people were like, you're going to be moving, you're going to be dancing, you're going to be doing what? Wait, no, 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 you need to be safe. And so this, we had the same experience when we were doing our program. We were, no, no, it's okay. It's okay for them to move. It's good for them to move, right? This is actually so kind of convincing the rest of the world or the community at large that this was a good thing that... Uh, people with Parkinson's had were resilient. You know what I mean? They could do it. And then ha the, the neurologists, when they came into the dance for PD, must have been blown away. Because it must have been like, this is, this is completely different. I think they were blown away because it was completely different. They never, you know, people have a certain conception of what dance is, but when they actually see what's happening in the class, it, it really changes their minds about what dance, dance training, uh, dance performance is about. And they understand that dance is a high level motor activity, but it's also a high level cognitive activity, social activity, and expressive activity. And anyone who understands Parkinson's it, the way that neurologists do can't help but see dance as really a, a perfect synthesis of those elements. If, if you were, I talk about this a lot, but if you were to go into a lab for three years and create a movement form for Parkinson's that was particularly, uh, that particularly addressed or specifically addressed the elements of Parkinson's, physical, social, emotional, and cognitive, I think you'd come out with something that looks a lot like dance. And I think that's what neurologists and neuroscientists started to realize is that there's so much going on in what people do when they dance. And I think a lot of these elements are in Nia too, for, for example, and Tai Chi. You see so much related to motor learning, to reward, uh, to using different um, different pathways than purely the automatic movements. I think it, it becomes clear why dance can be such a powerful and valuable tool for people with Parkinson's. So movement is the universal language, I think, of all cultures. And you've traveled all over the world. And um, how was it 
traveling all over the world to dance and then traveling all over the world to introduce dance for PD. Any similarities or? It's a wonderful question. I think when you're, when you're traveling to perform, you are sharing a particular style of dance with a community culture that might not be familiar with what you're doing at all. And so there's, there can be a certain um, fascination uh, with something that may seem quite foreign or exotic. In this case, it was, you know, American modern dance, which is, which is, can be a strange phenomenon for people in, in other places. What happened when I traveled for, to, to share dance for PD was that I really saw myself not so much as a, as an ambassador, but really as a sponge, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, we had worked to develop a particular approach, but in terms of the content of that class, the style of movement in that class, I wanted that content to reflect the community that we were in. Really, we wanted the, uh, the dancers who were coming to train with us, which is often why I was traveling and why I do travel. We wanted them really to adopt our methodology, but to use the forms of dance that were familiar and comfortable to members of their community, not to members of our community. That, that's a big difference, I think, in yeah, how you're absolutely. thinking about cultural exchange and um, cultural sharing. So again, we we were looking at a you know a, a template, if you will, for the structure of the class, the elements of how we would share a safe class, but the content was was designed to be very local, and often yeah. we didn't see yeah. what that would look like until we left. Yeah. And then six months later, we would get a video. We started our class, you know, in, in Pune, India, or in Beijing, uh, or in Cape Town. And this is what it looks like. And it was recognizable in its structure, in the approach. But the content itself was completely different than what we did. And we, we loved that. We celebrated that. We, we right. still do now because that, that really is what the program is about. And how exciting. Right. I remember uh, Debbie Rosas, the founder of Nia, once said to me, I want Nia to be like, like, how does God do it? She said, look at all these trees. They're all the same. They were aspen trees, but they're all unique and different. That's what I want my teachers to be like. And it sounds to me like what you're saying is that's what I want to dance for PD to be like. It's like it's different in India. It's different in China. It's different in Africa. It's different in, in even Nashville versus New York City. And so the other thing that's great about that is then you have the, you look at the classes and you go, that's a really great idea. <laughs> and you've got this wonderful cross kind of exchange of different movement patterns and different stimulation, which as we know for the brain being stimulated in so many different ways with music and movement is so enriching. It's like a bubble bath for the brain. So, um, but what about PD treatments around the world? Do you find any difference? It, it may be cliche to, to say this, at uh, at this point, but I mean, I think the the Dutch, thanks to Bas Bloom and his incredible efforts to synthesize and bring uh, coordinated care to each community through the Parkinson's net, is really a model. Um, so we can certainly learn from from Dr. Bloom and uh, and what he's created in Holland, the Netherlands. Um, I think the biggest issue that I see in many places where I've traveled is that Parkinson's is still, um, is still a, there's, there's an element of um, stigma around mm -hmm. living with Parkinson's that we have a little bit here in the US, but nowhere close to what I see in other parts of the world. And I'll give you an example. We uh, offered to do a dance for PD class as part of our touring engagement um, in Taiwan and uh, in talking with the presenters there and talking with some of the contacts in the medical community, they said, oh, we'll, we'll never get people with Parkinson's to come to a class. They just, they just won't come out. They're too embarrassed to be seen in, in this kind of setting. And would you consider changing the class to be a class for, for elders? And then we'll secretly tell the people with Parkinson's that it's really for them. 
And we had a meeting in our team and we said, no, I, I think part of what we do is obviously being respectful within, within other cultures, but, but also affecting change. And part of that change is recognizing, helping people recognize that there, there shouldn't be a stigma about Parkinson's, that Parkinson's is something that people around the world are living with and dealing with, and that we as a global community have a responsibility to provide a place of comfort and to provide messaging that lets people know it's okay and that there are resources for you. And we are inviting you here because there's nothing to be ashamed of. And dance is an incredible opportunity actually to come out and be oneself and be comfortable with one's own body in a safe space. So when we went back with that message, we ended up getting 80 people with Parkinson's to this <laughs> class in, in Taiwan. And, and I think people were so appreciative to be in a space where they felt understood, they felt valued. It was a reminder to us of the power of the arts to create a safe space, but also a reminder that in, in many places around the world, the medical community uh, can play a role in reinforcing that stigma, right? Mm -hmm. Can, can uh, at first glance, not necessarily be, uh, be recognizing that we need to change how we all think about Parkinson's. I hope in our small way that, that our program can contribute to providing a more welcoming space, uh, a safe space, a space where people can connect as a community and share challenges and share ways that they can um, live better with Parkinson's. Let's talk a little bit about your program because uh, there might be some on the call that haven't ever experienced it. Do you need dance experience or training to do it for Dance for PD? You do not need any dance experience or training to be part of a Dance for PD class. Um, in fact, the majority of people who come to class uh, have no dance experience. And, and a number of them also are coming in perhaps with a little fear of dance. They've, they've maybe had a bad experience as a young person and think that dance is all about being on the correct foot or you know, having to be on a certain rhythm and the first count or you know, following instructions or remembering choreography. And our program is not at all about those things. Our goal really is to create a sense of fun to create a sense of social interaction and, and foster a sense of creativity through dance. And the other things that happen are all, are all wonderful fringe benefits, but those, those three things are really important. You know, one of the things that we, we've seen is there's not only a stigma about Parkinson's, there's a stigma about dance, particularly for certain individuals, particularly for males in the United States. You know, a lot of men who come in, into our program said, I'm so glad I get to dance now that I have Parkinson's because I never got permission before. Wow. And, um, you know, people always laugh at me before. People make fun of me because I dance. Now that I have Parkinson's and I'm dancing, people cheer me on. Why didn't that happen 40 years ago when I really wanted to take, to take that tap class? Which is really a shame, I think. Because oh, yeah. it's one of the most enjoyable forms of human movement and expression as well as being probably one of the oldest forms of communication that we have. It strikes so, me that you're talking about being authentic, you know, whether it's the, the 80 people in Taiwan, giving them an opportunity to just say in community with one another, this is what I have and this is who I am. And, and I am also more than this. And, and even when you're talking about, you know, the men dancing or people that have been told they can't dance, you know, I get to move and I carry like our body is with us. 100% of the time. So to be able to use it and to, to enjoy it and to, to be with others and to, to move in a way um, that's free and be cheered on, that to me seems like uh, what we call in NIA developing a sensory IQ. So we have, you know, the IQ that we think about, but what about a body IQ, right? Mm -hmm. And so to, to develop that to me is a worth 
worthwhile way to spend our time. I don't know if you have time to show us a little bit, even with your hands, about dancing, but because um, I'm not sure if you have enough room there, but it'd be fun to do something. <laughs> sure. Well, I, I did want to go back to your question uh, mm -hmm. to just sort of give you, you know, like a 30 second overview. And, you know, oh, yeah. most of our, most of our classes uh, start seated because we realize that people coming into the class are not only afraid of dancing, but they're afraid of falling. And so we wanted to give people a really nice progressive warm up that is seated so that people don't have to worry so much about balance, but can work on other aspects of dance. And then people are always given an option to stay seated or to join us standing for the second part of class. And I think that reinscribes a sense of comfort and safety that we can try things out and we can prepare our bodies in a way that's not necessarily challenging balance. And then we're warmed up, we're ready to go. And for those people who do wanna stand, there's an opportunity, of course, to, to dance in a, standing position and to move across the floor and to do all kinds of fun stuff that's that's traveling but um but they're able to do that because we've given them a good solid foundation what i love about this dance is that um it's a dance for the whole body but it focuses on the hands so i often talk about starting to move our hands as if i'm take as if, as if i'm stretching right so you can just take a stretch to either side and then thinking about flipping your hands, right? And then thinking about reaching as far out, stretching your fingers, stretching your fingers, stretching your fingers down to the floor, you can't see me, <laughs> but coming up and then taking a circle in. So I've described some movements in quite mechanical ways, right, related to body parts and sort of thinking about it as a stretch but now, what if I take that same movement and I think about it in terms of imagery? So instead of thinking of this as a stretch, I want you to think about dolphins, two dolphins diving into the water. And they're going to dive into the water on one side and they really imagine the splash of that water around your hands. Yeah. It changes the way that you approach that movement. It changes the quality. It's not a stretch. Yes, you are getting a stretch, but it's about the intention of that movement. And then as I turn my hands over, think about giving a gift. What would that feel like to give a gift as opposed to just flip your hands, right? So you can think of dolphins, dolphins, give a gift and come back to your heart. And I want you to imagine that you're standing at the Metropolitan Opera House and you're reaching up to the very top balcony, the back of that balcony, all your friends are up there, and that's where you're sending your energy. And you're going to send your energy out to the mezzanine level and to the orchestra and to the conductor. And then you're going to sprinkle gold dust over all of them and bring it back to your heart. So again, it's, you're still getting a stretch, but I didn't say stretch your fingers. I said reach out to a balcony. Think about that external cue that propels our movement and gives us motivation to move. The, the imagery that I'm using is the motivation for moving. It is this, the equivalent of an actor reading lines versus an actor embodying that character and understanding why they're saying the lines. Because when you do that, a beautiful um, avenue opens up to you that allows you to, in some ways, detour around some of the movement challenges you might have. Your imagination is not impacted by Parkinson's, right? So you still have, we still have access to our imaginations all the way through the lifespan. Um, and so if we can use our imagination to initiate movement, to sustain movement, to express ourselves, then we suddenly have this new set of tools that we can use. Now, one thing I didn't add on to this, which you know, Caroline, is so important, is music, mm, right? Yes. Music is the, the thing that, um, that underlines all of, all of what we're doing. Let's try it to music and see how it feels 
to dance, not just move, but to dance with those qualities and with this music by Bach. <laughs> the bounce of it, right? So, just gives you an example of sort of, you know, music is that element that just connects everything, not, not only for us as dancers, but when we, when we look at images of a brain listening to music, right? That scan of a brain listening to music. You see how integrative music is. It, it lights up so many different parts of the brain that may not ordinarily work together, but under the influence of music, they start to, they start to communicate. And that's, I think, something that we need a lot more research on. But it is when people say, why, why can people move across the floor in your class when they have difficulty walking out on the sidewalk? The, the most likely answer that I can think of, the hypothesis I have is that it's about music. It's about that ex strong external cue that music brings. And it also helps us remember movement for people who may be experiencing short-term memory to embed or align music with movement helps us remember what the plan is. And that's just a, it's a very valuable tool probably the most valuable tool. You have said that your Dance for PD students are athletes. Do you want to comment on that and why you would say that? Well, I think first and foremost, they're, they're artists, but dancers, have, dancers walk this fine line between artists and athletes. We have to obviously train the way a professional athlete trains. Uh, it's the same rigor. It's the same t demands of practice and utter commitment. Um, and yet when we get on stage, we have to make that movement evoke something. It has to express something. Uh, I think when we watch somebody doing the, the high jump, for example, there's, there's a powerful emotional message that we get as a spectator but that person doing high jump is not thinking about expression at all. They're thinking about succeeding at that event. And everything that you see in the effort and the, the musculature and the determination, it's all emotional for us as spectators. We're, we're revved up in that way. But that athlete is not, is not thinking expressively. They're not thinking about it, um, projecting an image to us. They may be using imagery. In fact, I bet they are using imagery but it's a different thing. So a dancer, on the other hand, when they get on, on stage, their Olympic event, their movement has to look like something. It has to express a story. It has to, it has to share a, a, an emotion. It has to look a certain way, depending on the design of the choreographer. So there's a very strong aesthetic demand in addition to the athletic demand. And so dancers are both. The reason I talk about people with Parkinson's need to think like an athlete or a dancer is that they, they need to take care of their bodies and be disciplined to move every day the way an athlete or dancer does. Uh, you know, um, for a dancer to take a week off is a huge deal. When you come back from that week, you have to catch up. Your muscles have already, even as a 30 year old dancer, my muscles would atrophy in that week. And I had to get back to training at the same level. And it took a little, took a few days to get back to that level. I couldn't just jump back in. And because, you know, dancers like athletes, we have to train every day. Dancers are like musicians. You think about musicians practicing. Yo-Yo Ma still practices. He still has to sit down and practice. He can't just walk into a concert hall and play a piece. Well, maybe he can, but I don't think he does. I think he still practices um, because, because the body is fickle, right? The, the body and the brain are fickle. If we, it's like a language. If you, start, if you stop using that language, even for a few days, 
it's a little more rusty to come back to it. So for people with Parkinson's, every day we need to think about training our bodies and training our minds exactly the same way that an athlete does. It doesn't have to be the same, you know, seven hours of training or practice, but we need to do, we need to be disciplined about doing it every day. But we also need to think about other elements of uh, maintaining well-being. That includes nutrition. It includes hydration. It includes rest, right? All of those things are critical for success as an athlete or dancer, and they're as critical for success for someone living with Parkinson's. Any advice that you would give to anyone that's newly diagnosed with Parkinson's? We have folks that have been watching our show that are newly diagnosed. We have folks that have been living with it for a long time and some that, um, again, are new. Anything that you would recommend or, or say? Well, I think the most important thing is to, I mean, you and I are both big supporters of movement. And I think integrating movement into your life every day is really important, but it has to be movement that you love. If you don't love it, you're not going to want to do it every day. And then you find more and more excuses not to do it. So find the kind of movement that speaks to you, that you love. It may not be dance. It may not be Nia. It may not be boxing, whatever it is. It could be a walk in Central Park. Um, it could be Tai Chi. It could be uh, swimming. Whatever it is, find that thing and commit yourself to it. And also build in variety because we don't want to do the same thing every day. So maybe I should say find two or three things, two or three forms of movement that you really love and stick to those. Because if you love it, it won't feel, it won't feel like a, a demand or a hardship. I think the second thing that's been so important to our participants is the sense of community. And again, that means different things to different people. That sense of community may be at the JCC. It may be in um, a social group that you form based on mutual interests. It may be formed through religious affiliations. Whatever it is, that social network is so important when you're living with Parkinson's. Uh, because I think there's a tendency to want to pull back, to retreat, to, uh, to not be out in the world, to not be seen, or maybe you worry about imposing on others. If you find and develop the right social connections, those, those individuals in, the, in that community will support you through your journey. And that is so, so critical. David, you and I have both been doing this for quite some time. And as a result, we've lost some people that we just admired and really treasured. Um, what are some of the ways that you mitigate and manage that loss? I know for me, teaching and connecting with the community and sharing those highs and those lows has really been life-sustaining. And how about for you? Well, Caroline, you're right. We, we have experienced enormous loss, particularly over the last year and a half. And I think that, you know, the, the way that I am able to process and live with that loss is to think about the energy and spirit that each of those individuals brought to the community, shared in the class, and in many ways, sustain that class. When I look at that class, I see the people who are there, but I also see the, the commitment and the dedication and beautiful dancing of the people who are no longer in the room. It, they're, they're still there in spirit. And I think that's, that speaks to the sense of community that underpins the Dance for PD program, that even when you are no longer in the program, for whatever reason, you are, you're still there. You've, you've contributed so much. That's true. I mean, that really comes out of being a performer where it's such a fleeting existence, but the afterglow of your presence on stage, of you, the memory of particular performers and particular pieces, and we all have that, whatever art form we follow, um, it's there. And, and I feel the same way about our participants. So that helps me. We also have very prescribed rituals to recognize people who we've lost. And we use 
some of the class time to to honor them um, when they passed away and uh, to remember them. And so in that way, they kind of become permanently inscribed in our our circle, which is how we always finish class um, of passing a, a circle of energy around. And and by by mentioning them and remembering them in that circle, we we sort of inscribe them for forever. And I think that's something that's really helped me cope and manage with the uh, otherwise unfathomable loss that, that we've all experienced. Yeah, and such a beautiful statement. I know there are stages around the world, and when you step on them, you experience those that have danced before you. And I hear you saying the same thing here, is that when we step into that room, everyone that has danced is still dancing with us. They are. They're, they're there. We see them. We hear their footsteps. We hear the music that they loved. And that music resonates in our ears. And we hear the joy. We imagine the joy that they uh, had when they were listening to that music. And that joy comes back to us. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your, this time with me and with the community and and for your wisdom and your insight and mostly for your gift of dancing and how it's extended into just this other form. I think uh, you're still dancing um, and you're still uh, performing from the inside out. Uh, and it's just miraculous to see and, and to witness and uh, I have such a deep admiration and respect and gratitude for all that you and everyone that Dance for PD is doing for so many. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity to share thoughts and thank you for the incredible work that you have done for so long in supporting this community and sharing your gifts with them in a way that has been so sustaining and nurturing and life affirming. So it's wonderful to be able to call you a colleague and to, to share this space with you. Thank you. And maybe this year we'll be back in Central Park <laughs> at the walk, mm. warming everybody up and, and cheering everybody on. That would be really wonderful, wouldn't it? That would be a dream for sure. That would yes. be a dream for sure. 2022 may, may it happen. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time. Wow. Isn't he inspiring? My gosh. And when you think about it, as we mentioned, 20 years ago, they didn't encourage people with Parkinson's to move. And to see how instrumental the Dance for PD program has become worldwide in getting folks moving, it's just exceptional. And it just gives me, and I hope you as well, lots of hope. It's why I'm so grateful to be able to share with you all the movement programs and more that we offer here at the Marlene Myers and JCC Manhattan. Remember, if you would like to sign up for our Living with Parkinson's program, all you need to do is see the links in the comment section and fill out a short, it's very short intake form and, um, and just join us, join our community. Um, there's no need to go with this alone. And if you have any questions, you can email Whitney Chapman at wchapman at mmjccm.org as well. And finally, I hope that you will join us tonight. We have two programs on today, Monday, uh, November 29th. We have a really special program. It's called Broadway's Best for Parkinson's. And tonight we're going to be talking about spirituality, sexuality, and support with uh, Rabbi Simka Weintraub. He's going to be sharing spirituality and a special poem that he wrote that he shared with us on this program, Cognitive Hypnotherapist. Suzette Shamoon is back and she's going to be talking with Dr. Alessandro DeRocco about intimacy. And of course, Chris Jones and Mary Beth Kudal, his wife, will be talking about how they chose an assisted living uh, facility and how that's going. And then our very own Pam Quinn will get us moving. And finally, Broadway actress Stephanie Lynn Mason will perform for us a piece that she, when she starred in Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish on Broadway. So the link for this program is in the comment section. Click it on now, register, join us tonight. And even if you can't make the recording, 
or make the show, the show will be recorded and we'll send that out to you. It's really uh, quite inspiring. Our next program will not be until Monday, December 13th, and that will be with Gary Pauly. And he, <laughs> he is an Olympic weightlifter. Oh my gosh, he's somebody living with PD who, who lifts Olympic weights and uh, Olympic weightlifter, weightlifter. And I think he even won a championship. He's gonna to talk to us about that. So, and, and uh, you don't wanna miss it. And it turns out that Gary and I are, uh, I don't know if we're related, but he actually knows one of my relatives that I've never even met. Uh, so many magical things can happen when you uh, come on this show and, and meet people from all over the world. So please stay tuned. I hope you're well, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much.